Uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. We're going to continue plodding along through Luke, make some applications for all of us to think about in sharing this message with lost men and women who so desperately need to get to know Jesus and learn of his plan for all of our lives. Thank you. Luke 18, 1 through 17 will be the focal point of our, our lesson this morning. That's a lot better, isn't it? And Jesus tells three stories, if you will. The third one's not so much a story or a parable, but it is. There's a great object lesson there. And behind all three, Behind all three, we learn something about attitudes in approaching God. I don't always go over this section with people. What I usually do when I'm studying with people who need to hear the gospel, need to be confronted with it, is I, I choose passages in the gospel account that will help build their faith and come help them come to a, a knowledge of of God and of Christ. And as we're plotting through the gospel according to Luke, for example, I often have them read two or three chapters on their own, and I pick a section, a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, and we'll focus on that. I'll answer questions about anything that's in there, but I often don't cover this section. However, I think, as you'll see, there are some valuable points to be made attitudes in approaching God. What does it look like to approach God? Well, it looks like a widow in desperate need. Persistence. It looks like a tax collector who needs repentance. Humility. It looks like a little child who has childlike faith. And so the first two paragraphs contain parables and the function of, the, of a parable is to tease the listener into active thought. It tends to grab us by the neck and not let go until we think and think some more and think some more about the possible applications and intent. And then we have an object lesson of a little child in the third paragraph. So we'll take them one by one. First of all, the persistence of a widow who goes to an unjust judge, and he, she won't take no for an answer. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not give God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Persistence. Relentlessness. Won't take no for an answer. Let's get one thing straight, very beginning. The real point of the analogy, the comparison in the parable is not on the benefactor's side, but on the petitioner's side. God is not like this unjust judge. If anything, we have an argument from the lesser to the greater. That said, in the mystery of God's ways, with the veil of uncertainty, on our end of that equation. 
There will be times when we have long periods of silence, even when we're persistent in prayer, in which we don't have an answer that comes down to us on a silver platter according to our own agenda on our own time frame. There was an elderly black minister who gave a one-sentence interpretation to this whole parable, and I like it a lot. He said, until you have stood for years knocking at a locked door, your knuckles bleeding, you do not really know what prayer is. Take persistence. And make no mistake about it, God is not a cosmic ATM machine coming down on our terms, giving us instant gratification. Sometimes we have to wait. And sometimes God makes us wait. He's not an unjust judge. He's a just judge, but he still makes us wait. But the benefit of waiting is on our part, not on his. There's a whole vocabulary of words in the New Testament that pertains to the willingness to wait. Patience. Perseverance. Steadfast endurance. Long-suffering. But why would God make us wait? If we need something, we need justice, we need an answer. We need God to give us what we ask for in prayer. Why would he make us wait? Many benefits to waiting. And the New Testament addresses several of them. I'm going to give you four. Number one, so we can learn to depend upon God as never before. If everything came easily to us, we would not learn dependence quite as much as we would when we have to wait. Hebrews 13, verse 6 says, so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What will man or what can man do to me? When we have to wait for answers to our prayers, we have to learn dependence. We ask and we ask again and we ask again and we depend because we have nowhere else to turn. And through that up and down process with hills and valleys, we learn that God is our only refuge and that in the end, he does answer. And we've learned to depend upon him and no one or nothing else. And the willingness to wait also teaches us what a relationship with God is worth. Healthy relationships are like that. If every detail were neat and tidy, life would be somewhat predictable, maybe even boring. God wants to enter genuine give and take relations with us so that we have a, a real two-way relationship. And when you have a real two-way relationship with someone else, there are unexpected twists and turns. There are ups and downs, hills and valleys. And what those enable us to do is to get closer to God. Kind of like the stock market. It doesn't go up in a straight vertical line. There are troughs in between the high points. And so it is with our relationship with God through the twists and turns of, of this life. But we learn to value him even more over time as we overcome various forms of adversity. And without the willingness to wait, we would never come to that full appreciation. When we have to wait, we are forced to reflect on how long God has waited for us. If you think that this is just one-sided, think again. God, why don't you answer my prayer right here, right now on my terms? It doesn't work like that. 
nor does it when God asks you something to do something. How long has it taken you to repent of your favorite sin? How long has it taken you to resolve to do right when you knew you needed to do right? How long does it take you to earnestly seek Him? How long does it take to get busy in His service? How long does it take to give like you ought to give? We talked about this morning in class. When it comes to the waiting game, God will outlast us every single time. When we have to wait, we begin to appreciate the other side of the equation just a little more. And when we have to wait, we reflect on the value of the prize which awaits. We will appreciate it far more. Instant gratification is rarely a good thing. Abraham and Sarah just had to have that child, and so they decided to help God. That didn't end well, did it? Bring Hagar into the equation, and you have a, just a cascade of problems. You've heard the expressions, anything worth having is worth waiting for. The best things come to those who wait. And besides, waiting on God always has a good ending. You may not get exactly what you want, exactly on your terms, and exactly your time frame here upon the earth. But if you wait on God, it always, it always ends well. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31 says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Many years ago, my first wife, Cheryl, and I had some friends, Don and Joyce, and we went on a trip together. And uh, during this few-day trip, we decided to to ride horseback, go on a little horseback excursion. And um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a city slicker, okay? <laughs> I've, I've never been uh, one that takes to horses, but uh, so, you know, they, they give you the few minutes feel about what to do and what not to do, and, uh, and then they put you on this beast. And uh, my horse was named Girl. And they probably should have named Girl uh, Old Gray Mare because Girl, um, her get up and go got up and went. And what happened was Don, Joyce, and Cheryl and the guide, they were all, you know, in this pack here, this group. And then Girl got farther and farther and farther by. <laughs> and I tried to say all the right words of encouragement and kick her in all the right places, and, and didn't get anywhere with that. Until we got to the halfway point. And then it was, whoa! <laughs> I mean, there was this reserve tank that I didn't know existed. And girl tapped into that extra reserve and not only did we span the gap, but uh, sped on to the point where I was, I was really worried that uh, he was going so fast I might go perpendicular. In fact, I almost, uh, almost uh, thought that I was you know, perpendicular on the horse, that he was jumping around so much, galloping, because she knew she was going back to the barn. And that hope of 
bringing this to an end gave her amazing energy that she didn't have on the first half of that journey. And when you wait on the Lord and you know that you're going home, You can run and not be weary. You can walk and not faint. So there's value to waiting and trusting. The one key denominator is our unshakable tenacity to prove to both God and to ourselves how much we want this. How much do you want a relationship with God? How much do you want to go to heaven? How much do you want to repent of those nagging sins? How much do you want to break Satan's stranglehold on certain aspects of your heart? How much do you want to overcome your pitfalls in life so that you can do the will of God through all the struggles of it all? Do you pray and pray and pray some more as if I have to have this? I will not take no for an answer. And you're like that persistent widow who will never, ever, ever give up. But when Jesus returns, will he find that kind of faith in anybody? Do you have it? If he were to return right now, would he find you with this kind of faith? Or how about humility? Verse 9, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee Standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breath, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What's so evil about being a tax collector? The government needs those. But in first century Palestine, tax collector was virtually synonymous with notorious sinner. Or even another word that you might not think of, traitor. When you you read tax collector in the New Testament, think traitor. Working for a foreign government, upholding a cruel, corrupt, unjust system and lining one's own pockets, that's the typical tax collector in first century Palestine. They were hated. They were outcast. They were looked upon as as the worst dregs of society, the worst of the worst. So these two men go up to the temple, and and you have a side-by-side comparison. Self-sufficiency, on the one hand, leads to pride and a sense of entitlement. On the other hand, spiritual bankruptcy leads to humility and a desperate plea for mercy. Side-by-side comparisons, they're, they're powerful. One man saw his need, the other did not. One man was full of himself, the other had a spiritual tank on empty. One man was proud and arrogant. The other lost any vestige of pride when he took inventory of his sin. One man's prayer was an exercise in self-congratulation. The other man's prayer was a confession of sin. When I was a student at 
Florida College many decades ago, I heard a lesson on this parable. I think it was even a chapel talk one day. And the speaker said, the way up and the kingdom is down. And that stuck with me for whatever reason. The way up in the kingdom is, is down. Down on pride, down on ego, maybe down on your knees, but down. The man whom God justified saw his need and expressed it with his words, his demeanor. He didn't, didn't have to go down. He, he was already down. And therefore, he couldn't even look up. He was so down, but he, he looked to God with his prayer, and he walked home free of sin, not the other man. And finally, with childlike faith, verses 15 through 17, now they were, they were bringing even infants to him that they might touch him, and when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to him, saying, let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. I suppose the disciples were thinking, well, that Jesus is too busy, he's too important, the return on investment here in terms of, of the investment of time is, is, is not worth it. Let the master take care of more important business. And in Jesus' mind, what's more important than these little ones? So he responds, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. And truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. So we have not a parable, but an object lesson that's no less powerful than a parable. Children, little children, no pretentiousness, just simple trust in the goodness of the adults in their lives. Sometimes we grow up and that simple trusting faith is shattered after we grow up. And if we're going to enter the kingdom, we need to recapture that simplicity. Some questions of life are above our pay grade. They're just way too complex. And our assignment as people of faith is not to figure out everything it's not what a child has to do. A child depends on the provision of others, the protection of others, the care of others, and there's a trust that is behind all of that. And therefore, we, as people of faith, must depend on the provision of someone else, the protection of someone else, the care of someone else, just like a little child would. Parents don't always deserve that kind of trust. There are a lot of really bad parents. But God does. He's not done anything to violate that trust. And again, in another argument from, from the lesser to the greater, back in chapter 11, Jesus says, beginning with verse 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In terms of Holy Spirit, think of the agent of our connection to God. Uh, 
Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, the agent of our connection to God. It's the one thing we need more than anything else. Connected to God, in spite of our sin. And it's not self-provided. You cannot unilaterally force this. It's kind of like uh, manna from heaven. Deuteronomy 8.3 says, He humbled you and let you be hungry. And He fed you with manna that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone put on or by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Manna was not bread gained alone, autonomously, separate and apart from God, as if we were a child that says to a parent, I do it myself. No, it was provided by God day after day after day. And so are the most important things in life provided by God. We don't earn them. We don't make provision for them ourselves. God does expect us to go out and be busy, to earn a living. But but even at that, God open, opens up doors, these amazing doors of opportunity. God provides. God is behind all of our blessings, all of them, including the most important. So what should our attitude about that be? Like a widow in desperate need who won't take no for an answer. I've got to have this. And I'll keep barging and barging and barging. Because I've got to have God. I've got to have salvation. I've got to, I've got to go to heaven. I like a tax collector who says, God, be merciful to me sinner, or like that little child with simple trusting faith, the nuts and bolts of approaching God are not not handled so much here. Jesus has not outlined in, in systematic theological fashion, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. He's dealing with underlying attitudes that should drive those things. Our faith, our hope, our love. Our love for God with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, all the strength. Or just being like a widow or a tax collector or a little child who exemplifies these characteristics on the screen. Attitudes drive 99.9% of everything we do and everything that we are. So important. And if our attitudes are on the screen here, chances are we'll do what we need to be doing and be the kind of people that we need to be so that everything works out well in the end. And God will be able to bless us as his people. Are you subject to the invitation call of Jesus Christ? Can we help you in your obedience to the gospel? Or do you need to just come back to God on his terms? We're going to sing a song of invitation right now. And uh, this is to each of us to encourage every other person in the room. Others singing to you, you singing to them. Let's all encourage one another to draw near to God, and whatever your case may be, if there's something amiss, address it with these attitudes. Let's stand and sing.